Thank you very much. Thank you. So, uh, how many people uh, were involved with the neighborhood planning process that happened, oh, a year and a half ago? So, all right, a few, a few people will remember that. And one of the things that came out of that process was that uh, most of the people who participated really were willing to see some growth and some change in the community, primarily along the 35th corridor here. People wanted to see a little more activity. They weren't afraid of some larger buildings in some cases, not everywhere, but um, they did see, and they saw some uh, some opportunities for change. Uh, that there were some sites there that were kind of underutilized and some vacancies that were there and people started thinking, well, wouldn't it be great if we had a few more shops or maybe some mixed use to have a few more people, place, uh, you know, different kind of housing types, um, some, um, some development that would support um, uh, transit in this area. So uh, people said, you know, let's think about that. And there was no, hello, there's another uh, familiar face. People said, you know, we really ought to think about some change and what that means. Um, but I think I heard pretty strongly there that, that uh, people were also saying, we want to have some control over this. We just don't want to open the gates and let anything uh, develop in our neighborhood. We have just a few precious areas that, are, that may change and we want to make the most of them. We want to make sure that the buildings are comfortable, they fit with the community, that they encourage pedestrian activity, that they're safe, that they're high quality, um, and there are things that people will look back after they're built and really be proud of them. So, so one way you can do that is through design review. And I would like to talk a little bit about, in general terms, of the things that you want to keep in mind when you go through design review. Um, Cheryl's going to talk much more specifically about the Seattle process, which is a little bit unique. Um, in fact, it's a lot unique. I don't know of any other process exactly like it. So it's something that, that you need to understand um, in order to move forward with this. So like I say, I'll talk a little bit about what design guidelines can do, um, you know, and how they can help build a stronger community um, and, and get you what you want. So some of the successful things, just talking in general, um, you need to make sure that your design guidelines that you have, we'll talk about design guidelines, uh, that uh, encourage what you want and, and prohibit or greatly discourage those things that you don't want. You know, the kind of development, it, it may be, let's say, I don't know if this is applicable or not, but you know, it may be that uh, you're not wanting a big box retail. Um, and that's probably not applicable here, but in some communities it is. So you, you have design guidelines that really discourage the, the worst effects of a big box retail type of development. Um, and you want to make sure that whatever you come up with is reasonable for the city to administer. That, they're, that, the, that the applicant, the, pro the project proponent, and the city and the community can work together and come up with an equitable solution. So you want something that's um, easy to administer and easy to understand. And you also want something that's fairly predictable, that you don't that neither the applicant nor the community has to guess what's going to happen. So you want some way of controlling things that's flexible, but it's a little bit predictable. And you want something that also will produce a reasonable economic value for the developer, or else nothing will happen here. And I don't think that's the, uh, that's the intent of these. So those are the kinds of things you want to deal with. I'd also like to talk a little bit about the fact that in, in most cities, including Seattle, there's what we call a zoning ordinance. And the zoning ordinance tackles the big stuff, the land use, what kind of uses are allowed. Uh, in Seattle, it covers kind of what shape your building is, how tall it is, and how many floors, and uh, the size of it. So it covers those big things. But it's like trying to do, you know, a sculpting with a, with a meat axe. You know, if you really want to do some details, if you really want a good, you know, nice sculpture and with any delicacy, you need some refined tools. And design guidelines, what I'm going to talk about uh, tonight are those kind of refined tools that, that allow you to talk a little bit about you know, the character of the building, some of the amenities that you want, how it relates to the neighborhood, some of those other things that the zoning ordinance, which is kind of big and strong, but kind of crude, um, can't deal with. Now again, I'll, as I said before, I'll talk about in general things that you can consider, but you have to recognize that Seattle is a little general, or a little different. So some of the things I may say, you know, Cheryl may come back and say, well, that, that's good for some communities, but, you know, the way our uh, zoning code and our regulatory environment work, that doesn't, it's not quite right. So um, take what I say with a grain of salt. But these are things to think about. These are things when you um, engage with the city and talk about design review, and then also go through and look at the projects that may be coming up in your community. These are things to think about. So this is just kind of a primer on those things. 
So the first set of things is site planning, and that's the big stuff. That's how the buildings and parking and other site features are arranged on the site, generally the sizes, the location, the relationships between them, how it relates to the neighbors, how it relates to the street, those big things. And a designer, as Jennifer knows, will start there. Those are the big things that you kind of got to get in place in the first place. A lot of those are covered by the zoning ordinance in Seattle, but a lot of them are not. For example, one thing that I think is really important is a relationship to the street front. And then as you talk about particularly 35th, um, you know, I remember people talking, the vision that they came up with was something that's really pedestrian friendly, that has shops that are open, or other kinds of services. Um, and it really makes, encourages people to get out of their house and walk up and down and visit the, uh, the services that you have in your center here. So what, you, what we really talk about is things like making sure that uh, the buildings are transparent. We, we say transparent, that's kind of code for having windows, you know, so that you can look in, that they're comfortable um, to, and they're inviting, um, that they generally come close, uh, if not all the way up to the sidewalk, so that there's this kind of, uh, kind of direct connection as you walk down the street with the, with the street, so you can do window shopping or you're invited in, those kinds of things. Now, so in some cases, the buildings might be set back a little bit for a little bit of a plaza area, a little bit of seating, a little bit of an um, outdoor um, uh, uh, displays, you know, for like a hardware store or something like that. But generally what you want is that, that nice transparency, close to the sidewalk, um, very comfortable um, and pedestrian scale, and also a little bit of weather protection, a little bit of overhang. And if you go up and down 35th now, particularly up towards the 80th area, 80th Street area, um, you know, that's what you'll see in some of the more traditional... Uh, John, when you see pedestrian comfort, do you mean like you're under the overhang so you're not getting rain down or what do you mean like you, you don't well, that's a part of it. I think part of it's physical comfort, but part of it is that you feel secure. You're far enough away from traffic that you don't have the traffic rushing by you. Um, and uh, and you feel like you can walk comfortably down you, you know there's not too many, you know, you, it, it, generally we like to have about a 12 foot wide sidewalk so two couples can walk side by side comfortably and talk. Um, so those kinds of things. And thank you for doing that, uh, asking this question. Please interrupt me. I'd rather, you know, I'll, I'll go on and on forever unless you guys interrupt me with questions. So, uh, you know, I really would rather have you kind of speak up or questions or comments as we go through. Okay, I'll speak up. Yes. So, um, in, I live in Madison Park, uh, and we have this neighborhood is built with five foot sidewalks. Yeah. But the challenge is that the uh, plants from people's properties grow out across the sidewalk. Yeah. And I was wondering if the zoning is adapting to natural human behavior when it comes to such things and adjusting that dimension outwards to like six or seven feet. Well, uh, I've done a lot of design guidelines for different cities that do that, that say, yeah. yes, your setback to your building has to be so many feet from the curb line. Um, just talked about that up in Everett today along Evergreen Way where they only have an 8 foot wide sidewalk and really they want to have 12 foot wide. So, so generally uh, you can do that. Now Seattle again is a little different. They have attorneys that say, you know, we're a little hinky about that. Uh, but I've always found, you know, throughout the state that yes, you can require a setback and you can require that the sidewalk be built up to that. Generally speaking, when you do something like that to somebody's property, what you do is you give something back. You give them something so that of equal value, um, and just so it, they don't contest it. But like I say, Seattle's a little different, so they have a different set of lawyers and a different set of uh, ways of dealing with it. But generally, in in most cities, uh, yeah, we 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 require that. In some so another thing that's really important is compatibility with neighbors, and this is particularly case in, in a case I think where you have a main street like this. And then right on the back side of it, you might have low-rise uh, multifamily or even single-family houses. So in some cases, you may have a three- to five-story building, and it backs right up on somebody's backyard. So how do you mitigate that? And you see some pictures here. A lot of these are taken from Seattle, and you can kind of see the situation. We have large and small buildings. This is an urban designer's nightmare, because it's really hard to make sure that the people in the existing single-family houses have, the, have their privacy uh, respected. So there are ways, and again, Seattle's a little different. You gotta, you know, this I think is covered more in the zoning ordinance and design guidelines. But you can kind of consider and think about, you know, trying to um, step the buildings back 
In some cases, in Green Lake, for example, we allowed the building, the design guidelines say you can build a, build a building at least one story tall right up to the property line if you don't have any windows. In a lot of cases in there, the community said, you know, it's better to have a wall in our backyard than to have something, you know, trash and stuff that usually gets put in a setback. So there's a number of different ways of handling this. It's just something to think about. Now, this, this, this is uh, not a zoning diagram here, but when you, when you think about these things, one thing to remember is that a privacy line, you know, that, that you can recognize a person's face or when you feel like your privacy is invaded, generally is about 80 feet. Now, that's something that the psychologists and environmental types have come up with. And, so that's, and it's not a hard line. It's not 80 feet here, okay. It's kind of a soft line. But generally, you try to keep, um, you know, for, if you have a private space here, you try to keep people's ability to watch it away from 80 feet. So in this case, you might want to require a tree being planted back here, a dense hedge. And in fact, when I looked around, I went around to all these, not all, but some of the cases in Seattle where I have, where you have a, 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 like a, you know, an R4 or a, a, you know, a commercial zone up against a single family home, for home. What I found in almost all cases was that people put very dense hedges between their house. They're not hedges, but trees, you know, a series of junipers or some very strong tree. Uh, and so that's one way of thinking about it. Another thing you want to think about is sun angle. And in our climate, really, it's the south that you have to worry about. If you really look at it, if, if the building's to the north of you, it's not going to block the sun. Um, and, but in the south it does. And generally, if you get, uh, if you have a, you know, I'm just showing this out just to show a line of thinking. Now, other people might disagree with this, but in my mind, if you have, if you can um, get the sun in your backyard at the equinox, you've generally got your tomato right in Seattle. So by September 21st, if you haven't got the tomato right, you know, it's not going to benefit from any sun. And I, I'm kind of joking about that, but generally, if you look at the people's use of outdoor, and their need to have sunlight, you know, to be warm and be comfortable and have a picnic or grow a tomato, it's generally between the equinoxes. So that's why I say, well, it's about at 45 degrees here's the equinox, so that's generally why you do it. The point of this is that, that these numbers aren't sacred, but when you think about what is important in protecting privacy or having solar access, go back to the science behind it. You know, think about what's really important and get somebody to help you uh, think about what you really want there. Because a lot of times you'll have a, a setback for solar, but it'll be to the north of your house, and who cares, you know, because that's not... But privacy might be a very important thing. So just think about what's important. I won't go into that anymore. Oh, here's another thing that we found. If you look at... If you look at the other thing, say somebody's... Say somebody's living here, and uh, they have a balcony overlooking your hot tub party down here. Um, well, there's two things. If a person's looking down with an open railing like this, they can look right down. So they can just sit down there and bring on their Mai Tai and watch your hot tub party, which is probably not the thing to do. But if it's solid like this, or a screen, it has 50% of it, of it uh, um, occupied by wood or some other railing, well, then they don't. They still have the beautiful view of the outside. It doesn't impair on their um, uh, issues at all. Um, and their privacy, and it also protects the, the, the people that are living in the lower houses. So that's another thing to think about. Finally, the other thing that I notice going around here is that, you know, in a place like this, generally what you see in condominiums, and I'm talking expensive condominiums, you know, I, I, our office is right across the street from some place that costs like a million dollars a condo or something like that. You think those people would have some class? No. <laughs> they actually have more junk out on their balconies. I mean, you see bicycles and, and hibachis and really cheap, crummy lawn furniture. And here's this very expensive building that looks just like that. So, you know, that's another thing. It just looks a lot nicer. And even though I know a lot of architects like glass balconies and open, I mean, yep, yeah, Jennifer's saying, yeah. Well, I mean, it looks a lot poorer in your, in your renderings and it's a lot easier to draw. But in point of fact, really, in terms of privacy to your neighbors, and in terms of the ability to kind of look, have the building look nice when it's occupied, it really um, helps out. So that's just another thing. Another thing that I think is really important in these areas is uh, trash enclosures and service areas. And um, this is not your neighborhood, fortunately, on the top there, but, but it is one, you know, where you have 
you know, back of a fast food joint, you know, it's got all this stuff right, right next to a single family house. Just think of the value uh, of that single family house and the livability of it. So, so we really, you know, in our design guidelines, typically make sure that these things are located, generally not near a, a residence, but also have a, a lid and also be uh, made out of very durable materials because these things take a lot of abuse. And so we draw, do these. Um, moves on. This is one I would nominate this thing here for an architectural award. Actually, it's very well built out of really strong steel. The people loading trash don't even have to open a door. You know, it's very convenient. The trash is, uh, but it's but it's hidden. Um, no rain gets in there. Birds are not going to be in there um, nearly so much. And so it has a lot better thing. And, and when you look down on it from your expensive condominium, you know, all you see is a roof. You don't see an uh, open dumpster. John? Yes. Could you just go back to that for a sec? Yeah. Um, so I'm imagining the garbage trucks coming by, you know, the professional trash collectors, they don't want to mess with anything that's going to take time. So how would they get in there? Well, in this one, these doors do move, but, but then you don't have to move it for putting trash in. You just move it that once a week to take it out. They slide. Yeah, they, I, I think this one does have a slider. I think it's, but, but yeah, it's, and you always have garbage guys saying, oh, I don't want to, you know, hassle with this, but you know what, you know, a lot of cities are requiring internal, internal of the building to have a trash room, you know, and some have compactors and stuff like that, so to, in my mind, you have, have to move, you have to do your job, I think, is, is part of the life. Um, I mean, a little bit flip there, but I think really, I mean, there's all kinds of pressure to do this, but really, in the end, these things are really intrusive. They really lower the quality of the residential arrangement, so we don't want that. Um, and I was just up in Everett today talking about design guidelines for Evergreen Way and talked about how important this was along that corridor. Safety and security. Again, uh, what we try to do in a lot of design gu guidelines is codify what the police call SEPTED, Crime Prevention Through Environmental Design. And that has to do with not creating entrapment areas. These are just a few examples. Uh, like this one, for example, this area here, you know, if you're getting out of your car and there's a thug here, well, you have no place to go. But if you get out of your car and a thug threatens you here, you can at least escape. You know, those kinds of considerations um, uh, in, in, in environment, in design. And then you know, what they call passive surveillance, having, it's good to have upper story windows out overlooking, particularly uh, open spaces and other areas that might be... Uh, um, kind of vulnerable areas. And then there's visibility and a whole series of things that you can do to design guidelines um, to, uh, to make sure that these SEPTED principles are, are uh, administered. Um, another series of things that, uh, that, that are important in site plan vehicular and pedestrian access, providing good um, um, uh, access points through sites and actually having uh, raised areas for people to walk through parking lots. And man ADA, or what they call universal accessibility, really important. So those are the site plan things, the big picture stuff. The first thing that the designers or site planners do is to try to make sure that those big picture items are taken care of in their design. And that's, I think, you know, you can do more in terms of getting a really good quality development by, by paying attention to the site planning issues than any other thing. I mean, it's all important, but the site planning stuff is the building blocks. Um, another thing that I think is really important, and on, on 35th it's going to be paramount, is the pedestrian environment. So those are more detailed things, things that you uh, take care of, uh, mostly uh, aligned with the street um, to make sure they're attractive. And again, some of these are covered under public work standards in different cities. Some are guidelines, some are you know, just different uh, standards for roads and stuff. But, but um, I think it's something for you to consider uh, when you uh, engage uh, in your efforts. So size and materials are important. I've talked about you know, different sizes. I tend to in a very busy area, which might be a little bit more busy than you have up on 12th, but maybe a couple blocks around 12th and around 35th 30, 30 and 8th, um, uh, you, know, you might want a 12th of wide sidewalk. Um, because again, to a person, is, to a, two people walking the grass is about six feet. So if you want to have a good pedestrian where they're looking in or going into the store or something, so you want to have that six feet on either side, so that's why it's good. Um, curb bulbs, you know, are great where you have parking. Um, that's not in all cases. But it really makes, uh, it's really important. And so when, when new development occurs, you want to make sure that the, the, the sidewalks are attractive. And we sometimes, 
and our guidelines require or encourage pedestrian amenities. And those are the things like uh, uh, hanging baskets, um, bollards, uh, site furniture, benches, very important. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, those things that really enhance the streetscape and make it a lot more attractive. Now, this is not a street. This is somewhere in, uh, in, one of, in uh, I think, a university village. But you know what they're trying to do is to make it look like a street. And these guys know how to sell stuff. This is restoration hardware, <laughs> and, and they, you know, they know what kind of environment that attracts people. So they put that stuff there, and, and uh, I'm sure it's pennies on the dollar to them. It's worth it. Um, so I'd say the same thing is true of the public sector. Um, looking at pedestrian activity in open spaces, um, again, I think it's really important. Um, University Village has got plenty of room. Um, but even on 35th, you see it in your place, that little setback there by the coffee shop. I mean, it's, uh, this was a cold November morning, and here this couple is, you know, enjoying a cup of coffee, and they've got a little place, not much. But you can imagine what it might be if it was enhanced, with food, pots, or some little bit of an enhancement, maybe uh, some lights that would. Uh, warm the area up a little bit. Uh, yeah, but the reason they're doing that is there's something to look at. They're watching the Jasper apartment go up across the street. <laughs> <laughs> but also point. they're challenged with the, with the step and the slab. Yeah. Right so that's, you know, there's a, there's a sin there. The ADA uh, uh, accessibility is kind of a problem. But um, uh, anyway, uh, I'll just make the point that this is something to consider when you, uh, when you write the design guidelines. Another thing that, again, may be a code kind of an issue, but we tend to always coordinate with the design guidelines and, and, and try to um, uh, characterize what kind of open space you have, is residential open space. So generally, codes, zoning codes, that is, require a certain amount of uh, uh, open space uh, per unit. And uh, sometimes a portion of that can be in balconies and roofs. I forget what it is for Seattle, how all that works in Seattle. Um, and because they've changed it since I've been around, but um, uh, anyway, you want to think about that. And again, that might be covered in your zoning and maybe off limits when you do your design guidelines. But you know, take a shot at it, and and maybe it's just a characterization of the kind of open space that you want. And they say, hey, look, what we really want is not hardscape, or not uh, uh, we do want hardscape, or some other kinds of things. Um, again, think think about what what it is that's important to you. If there's a green space requirement for residences, how can we build big mansions that have about two inches of yard on each side of the building? Well, again, thank you for uh, this uh, reminding me. This, these guidelines are mostly for your commercial areas okay. uh, or multifamily areas. They're okay. not for single family, and I should have mentioned that up front. Uh, these these are, I think, I'm choosing the examples that would be mostly applicable to 35th, okay. by and large. Um, but, um, but I mean, I think it's still a question, even even for some of the developments that you're considering, whether it's mixed use or commercial. I mean, every space is going, every square foot of site is going to be precious. So they're going to, you know, any any project applicant is going to try to maximize their use of the space. And so, open space, open space, unless it's really valuable to them, is probably going to be shortchanged. I, I think it's just important that you kind of look at that mm -hmm. and, and write that into. Yes, sir. Yeah, you were discussing a, a pedestrian friendly uh, development, and you didn't mention at all vehicle speed. How do you keep the speed down on 35th and not, you know, foster a racetrack? Well, that's a very that's, that's a problem we have now. Yep, yep. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, but you can't do that to design guidelines. Design guidelines typically deal with uh, private property, not within the right of way. Typically. I guess I'm thinking of some sort of. Uh, uh, I, want to, I want to say structures, but that's wrong. Um, the sides of the street encourage slower speed, a neighborhood focus rather than a, an opportunity to get the, yep. through the area. There, there are tools that, that can be used. Uh, some, some people call them uh, traffic calming, for example. And some of the um, uh, curb bulbs or extensions can be done. Uh, in some cases, people put in what they call speed tables. And remember the old speed bump, like that? These yeah, are I'm, thinking of, I'm thinking of trees, and I'm thinking of, uh, of uh, pedestrian lined cross crosswalks. Crosswalks, yes. Areas. Yep, and all that stuff. Uh, yep. 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 Shops and everything that attract attention rather than allowing yeah. the driver to That focus. was discussed at a different coffee talk, and people talked about making um, parking on one side of the street so it would become a two-lane road instead of a four-lane road. 
and um, maybe even larger sidewalks and things like that were talked about because there were far left, lots of ways to do it. And I forget what the name of that coffee talk was. Well, you can go on the website and, and see that. It's been yeah, videoed. Sure. There was the number two. Um, it was really good. Yeah. Yes. Putting the parking behind the building rather than on the street side by the sidewalk. Is that desirable at this point? Yes. I would say yes on 35th. In fact, that's my point. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, here's, here's a, a, you know, a, a, a situation with a parking lot out in front. And I'm sure it's a beloved um, institution here and, you know, very important for providing services. No, but, no, no, it's not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it used to be. It used to be. Okay. It has to be So, anyway, this is the kind of thing you want to avoid in any new structure. Um, now, this is not always the case, with that, but, but in, in Long 35th, I'm sure that's the case uh, for what you want. And you might see some conversions of some of the uh, smaller uh, buildings, and you still want to prevent this type of thing. Mm -hmm. Wasn't um, Glenn use planning done before the 80s, or maybe the I'm not sure, the philosophy of the car in front, you know, the, the parking in front, and now, I don't know when that year was, we've moved to a more pedestrian-friendly street and moving the, um, the building towards the sidewalk. It's, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's definitely an urban planning thing of yore when they yeah, used to do this. They do but, but among private entities, it's still the desired thing. If Walgreens went in here, right. Man, they would want that parking lot right out in front yep. because it is handy. I mean, if you're looking, if you want to, if you're driving by um, and want some drugs, you know, you can, uh, <laughs> go in the front and it's right there, and they can see the parking spot and they know it's available, and they can zip in and zip out. So, so it's still, you know, whether it's Seven Eleven or or uh, Walmart, they still typically want that parking lot out front and. Um, it's very difficult to get uh, to get them to change that, and so even even a lot of cases when when the city first started to require this um, uh, buildings come to the front, like on the Safeway in Capitol Hill or the Safeway in QFC in Valor on 15th, you'll notice that they did do that, but then as soon as they got their building permit and as soon as they got the building built, they turned a, <laughs> you know they, they just almost trashed the front of their building. If you go by the Safeway on 15th right now, it just looks like heck, because that's their back door. They still have their mm -hmm. front door to the to the park, which mm -hmm. is around back. Mm -hmm. So, and it's just kind of spiteful in a lot of ways, but, um, and I'm sure it's spiteful. It's just, it's just wrong, but, <laughs> but it happens, and it's tough. It's tough for any public jurisdiction to deal with these things, but it's important that you do. And we can do that through the design guidelines. My understanding is yes. I'll let Cheryl talk about that, but I think I think that's true. I know Seattle's been on it for a long time, and, and it's tough though, particularly the uh, uh, corporate pipes from Chicago and other people places. Um, and I'm being a little bit snide here to try to keep you awake tonight, but um, you know, it, is, it is serious. Um, anyway, pathways to parking lots. Another thing that's really important when they wanted to improve. Um, I don't know how many of you remember that um, uh, uh, University Village before the makeover. I mean, it was it. It, it was really in bad shape. Um, and one of the first things they did before they did a lot of remodeling, before they got the restoration hardware and, and the big new QFC, before they did any of that, one of the things they did was fix the, fix the uh, parking lots. They put in nice pathways and street trees and historic lights, and and they know something. And they were successful right off the bat. They had enormous um, increases in retail sales. Um, so they know something that this stuff works. And, and it's something that we, I think, should require. So good pedestrian access to parking lots, nice street trees, and those kinds of things make a lot of difference. Now, I will say, in one, in one case, um, it takes more land to put all this stuff in. So in some cases, if the parking's a long back and it's small, you might just say, eh, we don't really care about that because we just really want that parking lot as small as we can have it. And we'd rather not make a big deal screen the outside really well and not worry about what it looks like. So, so there's a couple of ways of going on that. Yes? So when uh, Safeway on 75th did their remodel, what they recently did, <clears throat> the Land Use Committee, we asked them to put a pedestrian pathway 
through that lot, and they did not do that because it takes up space. Mm -hmm. So with a design guideline, like what would we say such that that would be a requirement? Well, again, you know, Seattle's guidelines are kind of a, a way of communication. And if you had a very specific prescriptive guideline, it would say, and it's just what this says here, thou shalt include these pathways no further apart than 150 oh. feet. So that means about every two lanes. I see. So, you know, and, and, and for prescriptive guidelines or zoning standards, those kinds of things, that's what you put in. Mm -hmm. And you say they must be raised and it must be landscaped, and it must have uh, ADA accessible uh, uh, ramps and everything. And in some cases, what you do is you extend that, you make this high too, so that slows traffic down. Oh, yeah. So, so and that's what they did at University Village, and it worked like a charm, and other people have watched it and said, hey, we'll do that too. And so here you see, in the Safeway in Greenwood, um, look what they did there, I mean, quite nice. That's on the roof, though. It's well, not on the surface. That's true, but... You know, um, even so, uh, I mean, that made it harder for them to do the planting. So if anything, I think it was a, the rooftop would discourage that. But you can kind of see uh, what's going on here. The other thing about the parking lot landscaping um, is that you want to have a screen around it. Even if you have it up front or on the side street, you want to make sure that, that it has a nice screen. But one thing that I've noticed, I think, is that there's a number of different ways of doing it. I mean, you can put a row of pyramidalis in there and you know, have a nice edge uh, or laurel or something, and that's one way or a 10-foot uh, high thing. Uh, but you can do it with a trellis. You can do it with a smaller hedge and a wall. Uh, there's a number of ways of doing it. So one thing I'd like to do in design guidelines is give um, people a, a lot of options in that regard. And some of them take less space. So if you're really trying to cram more parking in a smaller spot, some of these uh, trellises and stuff become really cost effective. But you've had a good shot there because that parking lot's mostly empty like that all the time. Because it's it's on the roof of the store. Yep. And the, they kept the street side parking and it's jammed because yep. they want to step right in the front door from the street side parking. And this is on the roof and you have to go in and go down an escalator to get yep. onto the main yep. floor. It doesn't, it doesn't work. But I think that, I mean, the point is that, that um, uh, this is what should be done for, uh, you know, parking lots. This is kind of that kind of activity. Uh, but, but your point is right, that, you know, the, the one that works, is a, the parking lot that works is the one that's convenient and people can see it from the street. It's great because there's space to park, but nobody's yep. parking them. Yeah. So stormwater in parking lots. Uh, uh, well, I should say stormwater everywhere. Um, there's a number of new ideas now about uh, rain gardens and ways of handling surface water. A real uh, I mean, it used to be the engineering way would be to get it off-site and get it in a pipe as soon as possible. Of course, we're not doing that anymore. There's a number of ways of doing that. So the other thing, I mean, I noticed you guys were front runners in sustainability. You had your whole sustainability program, I guess, still going on, which has a lot of different aspects to it. Uh, and so anything, if you have any kind of site improvements, I think, really consider the, uh, uh, the drainage. You've got good soil for it up here on a ridge. Um, Make sure that you a lot of gravel, I understand, so you do a lot of this stuff. Uh, and now, so the other step is building design. Um, so we're, we went from the big picture of the site planning down to some of the things that would be the site elements, and now down to building design. Uh, and this is where you can get a lot of design character, and the quality of the building really uh, can be affected by how you, how you shape that. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things about the character is just what kind of character do you want? I mean, I think that's a good community discussion. Um, and it's one that's really hard to codify, even the design guidelines. You know, people will say something like, we want the Northwest Regional Character. Well, what's that? Or, I've seen them that, you know, I want the Woodenville Woodland Character, you know. Okay, you know, what, uh, and, and you try to describe it. But, you know, you can, a lot of times what you do in design guidelines, you show pictures of it. Say, okay, we don't, you know, it's like pornography. We don't, can't say what it is, but we know it when we see it. You know? <laughs> um, so, you know, I mean, uh, to me, when I see, I mean, this to me is Wedgwood, but it may not be Wedgwood to you. You know, I mean, it's just nice and simple and very clean. And look at, I mean, if somebody really thought about the modulation there and how it all fits together, it's just really, but um, I think that's something that would be a very interesting discussion that you could have with yourselves about what kind of character you want. The other thing, though, is there are some things that you really want to think about, and, and one is um, 
uh, maybe not describing a style. I would generally, unless you've got a very strong characteristic style already, I would kind of steer you away from trying to go to or you know, something like that. But um, uh, the, uh, there are some aspects of architectural style or character, we should say, that are important. For example, the, the modulation and the breakup of scale. Or, um, you know, the top building, those two buildings are essentially the same building. Um, but, you know, the top one is trying to make it look suburban and big, and the bottom one is trying to make it look more neighborhood and, and cute. So the question is, you know, is that the kind of thing that you want to do here? And, and there's a number of techniques in design guidelines. This is where design guidelines are really good at, at what they call modulation, which is stepping in and, and stepping out of the building, and articulation, which may not, may have a plain surface, but different uh, colors and textures or the way it's landscaping or window patterns set up this repetitive rhythm that really uh, breaks down the, um, the scale of the building. So here's some idea, examples of that. Uh, one of the things you want to do in architecture is, is make the building comfortable or friendly or welcoming. And, and the way you do that, the one way you do that, is to make the um, elements of a building of a human scale. So that when you see the building, you say, oh, there's a door. I know how the size of the door to my body. Or a window with panes that are small. I know that. I know you know, how that works. So those kinds of uh, keys really allow you to think about, um, you know, how you relate to the building. And it just is kind of one of these subconscious things. It just is a nicer, friendlier feel. You know, the fascists, you know, in Germany, what they did was break, not having buildings of scale. So you looked up and you saw some of these fascist buildings and, man, you couldn't tell whether they were enormous and a mile away or a couple hundred feet and not quite so enormous. But, but that's part of the disorientation that they actually saw it. And here, of course, we're not trying to do that, I don't think. Um, so, so, you know, the door, very nice human scale door, smaller windows, the sign is pedestrian, the bench is a very good clue as to what the pedestrian scale, some of the details. Um, balconies, that are obviously balconies, are things that really give an indication of that. So all those things, I think, really help. And, it, you know, we don't try to and guidelines typically proscribe what you do. You can say, do something, and give them a whole list of different options that you can choose from. Um, building corners are important. Um, we, uh, we did some uh, guidelines for uh, a long time ago for Mill Creek, and um, I don't know if you've ever been up to Mill Creek Town Center, but we, one of the things we said, oh, let's, let's just make sure every corner is special, because they had a lot of small blocks. And, and Sure as heck, <laughs> the architects just went crazy with the corners. This one on the right is, is a corner that is from Mill Creek, and they, man, every every little block has some special luga that, that does that, you know. But it works; it really does work. It's very quite nice, and it just adds a lot to the character of the area. Um, we didn't think it was going to be that extreme, but but it does work. So you know, think about you know some of your the old um, Jewish community center and some of your special sites are corner sites, so. Um, you know, it's something that you can kind of either have a corner entrance, or, or a balcony, or a special overhang, or a marquee, or just something that you do there that's a little bit special. Doesn't have to be a big deal, doesn't have to be expensive, but just something that acknowledges that it's a corner site. Building materials and colors, uh, generally you try not to get too involved with that. You don't want to be too proscriptive in terms of materials. Mostly uh, what we do in guidelines um, is to say, uh, what you use, you got to use it right. Um, that uh, if you use sheet materials, it's got to be really well detailed and have a nice bead on it, and, and everything has to be nailed down well. So, it, so it's durable. That's the main thing. Um, uh, in terms of uh, some of the corrugated metal, same kind of thing. In terms of what they call the ethos, which is a styrofoam with a skin coat of uh, grout or something, you know, you can take it and put a pencil through it. Well. Um, don't try this at home. <laughs> but, you know, it's a really soft material. So we say, well, don't put any, you know, we have a, like a weight stock, so this might be a harder material, and then put the ethos up front, so, you know, a kid can't just put a hole in it. Um, I'm old exaggerating a little bit, but, but not too much. Um, in terms of color, again, um, you may not want to be too prescriptive about that. Generally, uh, when we do have a issue with color, it's with a historic district or something that you really want to get very, you know, uh, kind of a, uh, a very strong characteristic of there. Um, but even then, you can kind of do it, do it in a way that, that adds for a lot of variety, but 
but um, sometimes hold things together. For example, in this area, the guideline was to make sure that the trim color and the base building color contrasted. And that you save your um, uh, really bright colors for accent colors. So you can kind of see how that you know, adds a little bit of character and quality to it. But generally, you don't want to be too prescriptive, I, I don't think, unless you've got like a historic district or something. So I don't need to, uh, but why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you? I mean, Wedgwood doesn't have a specific building material that's consistent, but if it did, maybe you would do that? Well, I think what happens is when you do that, uh, I mean, there's a lot of reasons. One is sometimes, unless there's a natural reason for it, it tends to be false. Um, it also tends to discourage architectural creativity, something you often date on. Um, and it also, uh, it tends to date an area. You know, you might have a, a you know, a certain kind of uh, siding or something really popular in the, in the 70s, and now looks really dorky. It's like, I mean, remember mansard roofs? And everybody thought they were so cool, you put a mansard roof on everything? Well, you see a mansard roof, you're saying 1970s and 1975, and it looks really kind of strange. So we try not, I think, I think particularly in an area like, um, uh, like Wedgwood, that has evolved, that has an organic character, I think you want to keep that organic character and, and allow things to move and, and grow and change. Uh, but, you know, have some content, so that's the main thing. And quality is really important. Now, there are some building materials, since you brought it up, that we do generally mix. Mirrored glass is one that just tends to turn people off um, in most cases, at the ground level anyway. Um, uh, corrugated as, uh, corrugated well, asbestos, uh, fiberglass is, you know, deteriorates. Chain link fence is something that just sends just a negative message right now. When you see that, you're thinking either a schoolyard or jail or something. It's just a negative. Um, so, so we try to avoid those kinds of things. How about T111? Well, that's so a very good thing. Winnegar put T111 yeah. outside like that. So that's another yeah. kind of thing to try to prevent. It's a really non-durable element like this. What is it, Mr. Ward? Oh, a T111 is something that, uh, I don't know if they, do they make it still? Yeah, I like guess said Windermere put it on their site. Oh, God. Side. Well, I, I haven't, I didn't know that. But yeah. it, it's basically plywood with a kind of a rough finish and they groove it. And, and uh, particularly when we were broke in the 70s, we used it all the time because it was really cheap. But it's like it, big it, paneling or something. Yes, yeah, it's, it's basically a plywood outside. And so water would get behind it mm -hmm. and it would warp and fade and it just looked like heck. So maybe so, instead of pers uh, suggesting a material, maybe have your list of no-nos or? Well, I generally put a list of no-nos and then if you're going to use some things, um, uh, you know, add some special provisions. So, for example, a lot of communities say, uh, well, it's okay to use, uh, uh, well, cinder block, um, masonry units or cinder block, that's fine, but treat it some way. Use uh, colored um, uh, split face or colored ground or intersperse it with a tile band or do something that is a little bit art. Give it a little character. A lot of this, Particularly at the building level, is you don't want to prescribe what to do, but you want to say, hey, take some care, think about it. And generally, what that happens is, you know, I have a lot of architects come and thank me for these guidelines. They say, wow, I got my client finally to, you know, think about some of these things that I've been wanting to do for a long time. You know, I've been telling the client this would be better, and now the guidelines actually help that. So it's generally a good thing for architects. And being one, that Works for me. So, uh, but uh, but but it also is really important for the community. Um, so, uh, the other thing that I think you really want to avoid, and I think the design guidelines will do this, if not the zoning code, is uh, blank walls. So, a lot of times a store will have a great front, but then the side wall will face a side street and be just totally blank. And again, what happens there is it's not so much necessarily that that's absolutely bad, but generally with the building materials. It looks bad after a while. It either is white and is glary or it gets rings scorched. So what we try to do is to break up these blank walls. And um, generally we define them as a certain square feet without a window or opening or other feature. And there's a number of ways to do it. You can landscape them, you can put a mural on them, you can do a special texture, a number of ways of dealing with this. Um, uh, but we think it's important to do that. So you see here in this case, um, 
you know, they put kind of a trellis along here um, that um, will grow up and, and be quite nice. Especially with some of these green uh, screens that they have now, the you know, living walls that are really quite nice. Landscaping. Um, these should look familiar to you. Um, and, and I know uh, that was a very important part of the uh, fishing uh, process that you had. It was, uh, people really talked about the uh, large evergreen trees and the landscaping and the gardening and stuff here. So I know that's a really uh, key element. So you might think about you know, what is it that's really key there um, and what kinds of things you want to encourage. Again, guidelines in Seattle are in, kind of in a way to have a, to me, they're, they're a way of, of facilitating a conversation. You know, so you can say, well, here's the things you think are important, and, and the applicant, you know, hopefully responds to them in a way, and kind of talk back and forth. But that's the way I look at the process. And so, landscape, if you know what you want, um, it really helps. And, you know, enhancement, I think, particularly on 35th, is going to be what you want. So, you just make sure that, you know, when things like this happen, that you have uh, a nice uh, palette of materials and the paving and, uh, and uh, the way the shape uh, the shape space itself is important too. Signage, we're getting close to the end here. I'm almost done, um, but um, signage is important. Again, that's through the sign code. Um, and so a lot of times it's not something you can deal with too much effectively in Seattle. Uh, this was my last experience, but um, I'm not sure I'll say something a little bit different. But, uh, but I think um, if you can, try to address it. Um, it really is something that uh, affects the area, and you don't need big highway-type signs here. Um, so it's something you should really, really think about. And pedestrian oriented signs, something that's low, you know, below 15 feet, uh, and uh, generally on, on building faces is, or surfaces is the way to go with that. But all in all, oh, whoop, I forgot lighting. Oh, yes, how can I forget lighting? Lighting is important. Not only street lighting, but building light. I mean, if you really, you know, right now we're hopefully going to get into the spring pretty soon, and so we won't notice it so much. But um, but building lighting in the way you know the sconces off the building and the way building uh, the light from the windows and things really helps in the after hours environment. People just feel like coming out just like that. Now on the F, there you see uh, the street lighting there. When they did the street lighting. Um, uh, that some of the some of the restaurants increased their business fifty percent in the first year. I mean, they had some of the, the hot dog corn wanting to kiss Kennedy Whistler as this thing you know, um, made such a difference to their business, and they were struggling. I mean, mm -hmm. with all the street youth problems, they were really hurting, and you know, so it made a big difference. So lighting, I think, is something to really think about, and and sometimes we put lighting levels in the design guidelines. But overall, it's what's important to you. I mean, you're, you're hopefully you're going to have a chance to uh, work uh, with the city on this. And the important thing of that is that you get together and figure out what's important to your community um, and how to, how to work with it. So I'm going to turn it over to Cheryl now, and she'll give you the real facts. <laughs> <laughs> the most good jokes, probably. So. <laughs>